World Spaceflight News Special Report. Starting on my left, we have Kate Calvin, Chief Scientist and Senior Climate Advisor for NASA, Selma Churchali, Earth Observation Program Manager from CNES, Nadia Vinogradova Schiffer, SWAT Program Scientist for NASA, Tamlin Pavelski, SWAT Hydrology Science Lead from the University of North Carolina, and finally, Benjamin Hamlington, research scientist for the sea level and ice group at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is going to show you the current Earth observing fleet. We have more than two dozen Earth observing satellites and instruments in orbit, including several on the International Space Station. We have more than 60 years of satellite observations. Many of those observations and satellite missions are in partnership with other U.S. government agencies or international partners, like SWAT, which is in partnership with CNES, the French Space Agency, with contributions from the U.K. and Canadian space agencies. And SWAT is continuing our legacy of partnership. When we're looking at Earth from space, we've been observing the Earth for decades. So we can see both the state of it now as well as how it's changed over time. And we're thinking about where NASA is going forward in Earth science. It's continuing to innovate and do new observations, as well as to work on providing that information to the public um, as stakeholders and users to ensure that they have actionable information as they're going forward. And SWAT is a part of both of that. Uh, SWAT is, a, is one of the missions that's going to help us lay the uh, foundation for going forward, a new generation of Earth observing and remote sensing missions, um, both because of the type of information it provides, but also the diversity of people that we're expecting to be able to use that information. So it is part of a future set of, of Earth observing satellites. Another um, area we're working towards is the Earth System Observatory, which is the next set of missions that will provide a more holistic um, picture of the Earth. In terms of um, accessibility of information, we're going to be reaching a, a new set of users with SWAT, and we're also working within NASA to provide that information and make it more accessible through things like the Earth Information Center. So just a little bit about SWAT before I hand it over to my other colleagues on this panel. So it is uh, about surface water and ocean. So it's on the surface waters, it'll provide the first global survey of water running through rivers and lakes. It'll help us understand where water is, where it's coming from, and where it's going. For oceans, it's going to allow us to observe ocean features with higher resolution. Oceans absorb a lot of carbon and heat, and this will give us a better understanding of that, those processes and help us improve both our understanding of the oceans as well as our projections into the future. As the Earth Observation Program Manager and the former SWAT program, this is with a deep emotion that we are merely now less than two days before the launch SWAT. And the SWOT launch today is really, is really timely correlated to the anniversary of more than three decades of excellent cooperation between NASA and CNES, marking the anniversary of the launch of the first Pathfinder mission called Topex Poseidon, dedicated to ocean altimetry mission. Since that time, the international cooperation has been extended to many other space agencies, operational ones, UMETSAT, NOAA, and the European Union Copernicus program has decided to implement a new generation of Copernicus Sentinel-6 Mike Fraglich, which, be, which has taken over Jason-3 as the new satellite altimetry reference missions. Could you please put the slides? If NASA and CNES have decided to make this mission happen, extended to UK Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency, it really thanks to their trust to collectively have the capability to handle such innovations and challenges. Few days ago, 
We were on the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite Plenary Meeting in France in Biarritz, where we had the opportunity to meet with the UK Space Agency leader, CSA leader and NASA and CNES with the picture you have just in front of you. This is a great celebration marking this excellent cooperation and what a better present than the SWAT within this anniversary of 30 years of cooperation. Of course, within the global warming, there is a huge impact today we know on water cycle. Accelerating this water cycle by putting some draft in some parts of the world and floods in other parts. And we are reaching uh, our knowledge within the Earth cycle with some limits. And we know that many of the compartments of this water cycle to be understood. And that's why SWOT will be really a point finder mission providing new measurements, a new era by having a global first global invent inventory of the surface water bodies by providing heights of the surface water slopes and delivering what we called the growl of hydrologists, which is discharge. And in the meantime, we will have also an important fine picture of uh, the stock water within uh, the lakes, reservoirs and wetlands. We are speaking about uh, revolution in hydrology, but in the meantime, we will for the first time address a key processes within the ocean. Those key processes are totally unknown today. The scientists made an important hypothesis that with those fine scale processes, currents, eddies, filaments, SWOT will provide those measurements in order to understand those processes which play a critical role in the global circulation ocean and related to climate change. And this is really uh, important uh, provision from, of course, the SWOT mission. Next slide, please. Since the beginning of the program, and uh, the Memorandum of Understanding, uh, which was signed between NASA and CNES, the science community was initially involved from the beginning. First of all, for establishing the science requirement. Then after, with the science definition uh, uh, team and the science team, they play a key role in order to refine those requirements and the specifications taking into account the constraints from the technical point of view and budgetary ones. And the way that uh, we used to work closely between the projects and the science community was built through and over these three decades. And this is really a, an important aspect of the success of the past and current missions, and of course, of the upcoming one, the SWAT missions. And the next, next uh, slide, please. We had many, many meetings with the science team. And we now have more than 17 countries involved within the preparation of SWAT. Why 17 countries? Because, because with this unprecedented measurement, new ones, we need to make calibration and validation of those measurements. And across the world, there are many teams already in starting block in order to check those measurements and to validate them. Next slide, please. NASA and CNES worked jointly to prepare the call towards the science community in order to decide to assess and to, of course, identify the key proposal that would make really advances in science and in the projects. And here you have uh, some of the meetings we had in France in 2015. Next, please. And the last one before the COVID crisis was held in Bordeaux in 2019 with the, one of the key NASA science program, Eric Lindstrom, who has now retired. And we have now Nadia next to me, who, who has become the, the new uh, ocean science program. 
Of course, beside the science perspective and the awaited advances uh, that is expected from SWAT mission, since the beginning, we initiated the SWAT early adopter programs. On French side, we called, we called that the SWAT downstream preparatory program. The aim of the program is to enlarge beyond the science community to all users around the world and of course uh, within the water agencies, within the of course uh, uh, navigation ag agencies, uh, many users in order to allow them to prepare the handling those SWOT data within their permises and within their own system in order to deliver operational services. We are speaking about prediction of floods and we are waiting, of course, an important improvement of those uh, key models for prediction floats, but also for ocean circulation at the key scales. So we are really waiting all in a very exciting manner, this uh, marvelous and a uh, Pathfinder SWAT mission and looking forward to the success of the SWAT launch. And, uh, thank you, Selma. Reminding of uh, NASA CNES, uh, strong altimetry marriage that going on a fourth decade. It's an open marriage. We're making new friends along the way with Canada and UK uh, with the SWAT. And as Selma already mentioned, SWAT is a Pathfinder mission. Uh, and what it means is that uh, there are many firsts with a SWAT uh, satellite mission. We're testing uh, new technology, new approaches uh, to measure earth water, height, volume, its dynamics. We are forging a new community of scientists and users. We are changing the culture, uh, the business of doing science, making uh, critical and complex Earth information more accessible, more inclusive, more actionable, uh, while still maintaining the highest standards of scientific integrity uh, of our information that both NASA and CNES are known for. So uh, with that many firsts and all eyes on SWAT, um, it's truly a pivotal moment for our space science industry. Uh, a moment that will define uh, future uh, standards in Earth observing, particularly um, uh, satellite altimetry, uh, in order to define, are we truly maximizing with this new technologies and new approaches, are we maximizing our uh, return uh, on investments, our scientific and societal uh, return on investments, and observing and predicting Earth water is a worthy investment as we as humanity uh, depend on uh, earth water to survive and uh, prosper. Um, let's just take a quick look at how water moves, a little bit earth science one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, if you don't mind, just uh, the first image. What we're looking here is the precipital water and how the water moves from ocean to land. We know that uh, oceans is the ultimate source of all moisture and water on Earth. Think of oceans, those huge warehouses uh, that supply moisture and water for, uh, to land that we rely in as our drinking water, agriculture and industry. And this SWOT a global look uh, on both ocean and land water. It gives you truly look at the supply and demand chain in order for us to truly look at the earth water as a holistic process. And that enables a better predictive capability if you truly observe the supply demand, ch uh, demand chain. Just think of it as if you come to your local grocery store and you wanna buy some fruits or vegetables <coughs> and the shelves are empty. Right. I mean, at that point, it's kind of too late to prepare. Uh, but if you have information that your uh, farmer, your supplier of your produce experienced some disruption, either shortage or excessive supply, then you have more time to prepare those disruption in it when you come to the local uh, grocery store. So the same with earth water. If you want to uh, prepare for the upcoming flood or, or a deficit of land water, uh, <coughs> you do look at your supply, your farmer, the ocean where the, uh, where the moisture originates. Um, so that's, of course, a unique aspect of the mission and uh, a, a welcome one. 
Another uh, breakthrough with the SWOT technology, of course, is that we're going to look at earth water um, at a very <coughs> high resolution and clarity like never before. I call it a SWOT goggles. So it's a 10x improvement in clarity and resolution of, uh, of earth water. Uh, let's see what it means for the ocean, if you don't mind, uh, on, the next, uh, on the next animation. What we're looking here is uh, um, ocean movement. Ocean movement, uh, the red colors represent warmer oceans and the blue colors are cooler oceans. And what we see here is essentially that uh, ocean is a turbulent flow and uh, uh, ocean turbulence and 80s are constantly on the move and they are busy and effective engines transporting uh, a large amount of uh, kinetic energy, heat, mass, salt, nutrients, carbon, plastic, pollution, you name it. So this constant movement uh, of, uh, that is initiated by, by those uh, active uh, players in the climate system are what keeps our Earth system uh, functioning or uh, dysfunctioning, uh, as, as we already see in our measurements. So when we are um, in the business of making better prediction of the Earth system, of the global warming, we, uh, we rely on the ocean to take it for the team, Team Earth, and absorb most of the global ocean, uh, global warming within the ocean. And that, think about it, that um, half of the vertical transport of this heat absorption from the surface to the deep ocean is done by turbulence, half. So turbulence matters. Perhaps a turbulence is that missing climate uh, puzzle piece that we've never observed and that would help us solve this climate prediction better. Enter SWAT a very timely entrance and entrance as we look at our changing water on planet Earth just in front of our eyes. So we're ready for you, SWAT. So as you've heard from some of our other speakers, um, we're really going to see this, uh, this, this big new capability with SWAT to see our rivers and lakes in high definition. And that's, that's immensely exciting. So right now with satellite imagery, um, we can see pretty well where rivers and lakes are located, right? We can see their area pretty well, but we don't do nearly so well in terms of our ability to see the height of the water in them. And uh, uh, really the, the key advance for SWAT in terms, of, in terms of surface water hydrology is that we're gonna be able to simultaneously measure the extent of water and the height of water. And adding that new dimension is critical because it allows us to, to think about things in terms of volumes and changes in volumes over time, right? So all of us learned about the water cycle at some point in elementary school or middle school. And uh, you know, we heard a little bit about it from Nadia already thinking about the transport of moisture from oceans uh, via the atmosphere onto the land surface. And for the entire water cycle, if we really wanna understand it in, in ways that are important for us, we need to be able to think about it, not just conceptually, but in terms of volumes, how much water is there and how is it flowing from place to place. And SWAT is going to allow us to do that. For, for lakes, we'll be able to see how the volume of lakes and reservoirs increases and decreases over time. And for rivers, we're going to be able to see how uh, essentially we'll be able to track the volume of water flowing through rivers from space, which is, which is just really exciting and, and uh, frankly pretty unprecedented. So what are we actually going to see with SWAT? Let's get, get, get down to brass tacks here. Um, for lakes, we expect to see uh, lakes larger than about 15 acres, so that's 250 meters by 250 meters. And we expect to see almost all of the world's rivers wider than about 330 feet, or about 100 meters. So let's take each one of these individually and let's start with lakes. Could I have my first uh, slide, please? So right now, if I went out and wanted to get data on changes in water level or volume in uh, some, of, uh, some of the Earth's lakes, I could probably get pretty good on the ground data for maybe a few thousand of them um, scattered over the world. SWAT is going to observe millions of lakes. So we're going up by orders of magnitude in, our, in terms of our capability to track water through lakes and reservoirs. And this matters a lot, whether you're thinking about uh, a really ecologically vulnerable lake, like the mountain uh, lake that, I, that uh, we have up here in this image, 
Or if you're uh, thinking about a reservoir in a rural part of India where people depend on that water for irrigating their crops, SWOT is going to pr provide the free and open data that everyone needs in order to be able to track these really important resources. Okay, so what about rivers? Uh, could I have uh, the next image, please? So what you're looking at here is a map of all of the rivers that we plan to observe with SWAT. There's about 2.1 million kilometers of rivers worldwide. And um, for, for all of these rivers, you know, we, we, uh, we plan to uh, be able to observe that volume of water uh, moving down them, which is, which is uh, really impressive. So right now when we, when we try to observe uh, rivers around the world, we use a network of, of, of sort of on the ground gauges. And those gauges are uh, expensive to maintain and install, and they're very unevenly distributed around the world. Um, now they can do things that SWAT can't, right? Like they can provide data every 15 minutes, which is great. But SWAT can also do some things that they can't. So for example, SWAT will observe the entire length of a river rather than just what's going on at a single point, which is really cool and, uh, and, and, and really different. Um, so let's look at one specific example here of, of, of where SWAT might, might make a difference for rivers. Could, could we have the next image, please? So what, what we're looking at here are the rivers that we expect SWAT to observe in the Congo River Basin. So the Congo, it's the second largest river in the world. Uh, about 75 million people live in the Congo River Basin. And yet, we actually have good on the ground observations of, uh, of, of flow through the Congo River at a handful of places in this entire area. And with SWAT, we're going to be able to observe all of the rivers that you see uh, up on the screen here. And it's going to really help us do a better job of serving people who live in this basin. And that's particularly important because the UN has identified the Congo Basin as, as a, a, a basin that's particularly vulnerable to uh, the impacts of climate change. So if we put all of this together, SWAT is really going to uh, allow us to understand sort of how water volume changes in our rivers and lakes um, worldwide. And that's a, a new and exciting thing. So I've been working for, for the last 20 years or more on uh, trying to use satellite data to understand Earth's uh, surface water. And we're constantly having to come up with ways of using data from satellites that weren't designed for what we want to do, right? We're repurposing other people's data. And we've been able to do cool things with that. But SWAT is the first satellite that's specifically designed to study rivers and lakes. And it's going to be a real game changer. I'm so excited about it. Back to you, Jasmine. I want to focus in a little bit more on some of the societal benefits and applications of the SWAT data. We've heard that SWAT is going to provide measurements of nearly all surface water here on Earth. Um, we're going to have measurements over the land, over the ocean, but also where land and ocean meet in this coastal interface, which is really critical. So many people around the world live along our coastlines. Um, so SWAT's going to provide really relevant information for all these communities, all these people living in these different places, and allow us to make measurements that will ultimately improve our, our lives and livelihoods. So I want to walk through some of these examples, um, starting with the land first. So as Tamlin and others have said, SWAT is going to give us this really new look at the lakes, rivers, and reservoirs across the globe. So on these global scales, we're going to be able to see things that we just could not see before. We're going to be able to track the movement of water around the, the earth between ocean and land, be able to make some of these connections, and really understand where water is at any given time. Um, so this is really critical because we know with climate change that the Earth's water cycle is accelerating. What this means is that some locations have too much water, others don't have enough. We're seeing more extreme droughts, more extreme floods. Uh, precipitation patterns are changing, are changing, becoming more volatile. So it's really important that we try to understand exactly what is happening um, using this SWOT data. So if we can pull up the first visual. Um, so in this visual, we're showing uh, the Connecticut River, which flows through several states in the Northeast uh, United States. Um, SWAT is flying over with its SWAT measurement, measuring the, the full extent of this river as, as SWAT, as a, uh, excuse me, as Tamlin referred to. These red um, colors here are higher, higher water levels, so SWAT is measuring water levels, not just the extent of uh, the river as it changes over time. But SWAT's going to continue to make these measurements, track the changes that are occurring in rivers like the Connecticut River, and provide very important information for those that rely upon it. 
So what does this mean? So with the SWOT data, we can give really important information to a, a wide variety of stakeholders. Really anyone that cares about water should be, should be concerned about what SWOT's gonna provide. We have water resource manager, uh, managers, we have um, uh, emergency preparedness agencies, civil engineers, uh, for those of you at home who are maybe concerned about uh, access to water or flooding and drought, we'll be able to better predict those the occurrences of those things with the SWOT data. So it's really going to provide rich information that impacts all of us. Um, and really importantly, it's going to measure these on global scales, right? So in the U.S., maybe there's some areas that we monitor really well with in situ observations. Uh, but on global scales, uh, some of these rivers, lakes are very difficult to measure. SWAT's going to provide um, a solution to that. We'll be able to see those changes that are occurring on global scales, not just in specific locations. So shifting gears a little bit, focusing on the coastlines. So we know sea level is rising. Climate change is causing sea levels along the world's coastlines to go up. We know from other NASA satellites that the rate at which sea level is increasing is increasing itself. We can have our, our foot on the gas pedal in terms of the sea level rise that we're seeing. The impacts that are associated with the sea level rise are also expanding. They're worsening in severity. The impacts are getting worse. Here in California, where we are today, we see coastal erosion that's happening because of higher sea levels. Um, in other parts of the country, of the US, we see greater storm surge associated with hurricanes. And all along the world's coastlines, we're seeing these impacts increase, flooding start to increase, and populations become threatened by sea level. Now, it may be surprising, but in some of uh, these locations around the world, we really don't have a good understanding of what's happening at the coast. So the satellites we have now don't get us right up to the coast, a little bit offshore. We have tide gauge measurements, which are directly at the coast, but they're very sparse across the world's coastlines. There's big gaps between them. So again, it may be surprising, but we just don't know what's happening with coastal sea levels in a lot of these locations around the world. If we can pull up my, our, our next animation. The reason it's so important to understand these changes is because there's pretty fine scale sea level changes that are occurring in these coastal areas. This here is an image of the Mississippi Delta region. Um, you can see SWAT flying over the ocean, through that coastal interface, and onto land. And it's going to provide rich information across all these different components of the, that coastal zone. So we'll, we're going to be able to provide this information to those that need it most, these coastal communities that are already planning for and adapting to the sea level rise and coastal impacts that are occurring. There's a wide range of stakeholders uh, that, that are impacted by uh, sea level rise. Um, national security is an issue, certainly, that, uh, that comes up. Our military has a lot of infrastructure in these coastal regions. Being able to provide this information to the military and other coastal communities will allow them to better plan for what's happening and account for those changes going forward into the future. So what is being done to ensure this data is actually useful? How are we, what are we doing to make sure that this data can be used in all these different applications? So there's a couple things. So SWAT has this concept of open science. So we're making the data associated with SWAT available, publicly available. That's, that's certainly important. But beyond that, we're also building tools to help people work with the data once it becomes available. Right? So we're not just providing the data, but in, uh, encouraging people to use it, interact with it, and start to um, implement it within their applications. Additionally, we have something called the Early Adopters Program, which you've already heard about. It's an international program with uh, early adopters, these different uh, people who are working um, in, say, water resource management, uh, working on the oceans, different applications. They come in and work with the SWAT team to really understand how to implement the SWAT data once it becomes available. It's an international uh, team of these early adopters. We actually have a couple early adopters here that are going to be at launch with us tomorrow, one from India one from, from Germany. So it's a really global scale effort to ensure that the SWAT data is ultimately useful. So just to wrap up, the SWAT data, it's, it's going to measure surface water everywhere, right? We're going to have measurements both over land, over the ocean, but also that coastal interface. And it's going to provide such important information. It's going to be transformative in our ability to provide information that will ultimately improve the daily lives and livelihoods of almost everyone here on Earth. And I'm also very proud to be the NASA launch director for this incredible mission, SWAT. I'm very excited to be a small part of a very amazing team that's represented here today. SWAT is the sixth NASA science mission that we will launch on a Falcon 9 rocket, and it will depart Earth from historic Slick 4 here at Vandenberg Space Force Base. I would like to recognize the nine SWAT launch team, SpaceX, NASA, Kness, TALUS, and the U.S. Space Force's Space Launch Delta 30. This assembled group of professionals is exceptional. And I would like to take a moment to uh, give you guys a peek behind the curtain. So we represent each of our organizations, but if you guys could see what goes on behind the scenes 
with the teamwork involved with working with Karen's team at headquarters and Parag's team at JPL. And then obviously Juliana represents an incredible launch vehicle uh, team at SpaceX. It's just amazing how we're able to bring all of this together, this SWAT capability to, to all of us here on Earth. So uh, uh, we, we get to see that every day in what we do, but I uh, just wanted to have a, a moment to share that with you guys. And one other personal item, uh, I'm the launch director for this mission, but uh, I by far don't do it alone. I have an incredible team from LSP, but there's one individual that this will be his last LSP mission, and that's uh, our LSP senior launch director, Omar Baez. And uh, Omar, I know you may be out there watching. Uh, you've meant so much to me. Uh, you brought me into this role over the past uh, decade plus, and uh, if Many people have worked with Omar and know him. He's incredible to what he's brought to LSP and how he has steadied our launch team for so many years. We're going to miss him when he retires in February, uh, but don't go far. I'll be picking up the phone to call you often. All right. Uh, so the integrated Falcon 9 team has been busy with final launch preparations. Last week, we encapsulated the SWAT spacecraft inside the payload fairing, and we performed a successful mission dress rehearsal. Just last Friday, the combined launch team held our flight readiness review, and then later that same day performed a static fire uh, with a successful seven-second static fire lighting of all nine of the Falcon 9 engines. Subsequently, the rocket was returned to the Slick 4 hangar, uh, where the SWAT spacecraft was mated on Monday of this week. Now I'd like to show a video of the launch team's efforts here at Vandenberg uh, to get us ready for this launch. Uh, please roll the video. Okay, here you see a uh, 747 bringing a lot of ground support equipment for the SWAT spacecraft from Europe, uh, where it was manufactured. And so this all occurred a couple of months ago in October, right here at Vandenberg. And there is an Air Force C-5 bringing the actual SWAT spacecraft. Uh, there's SWAT in its shipping container coming off of that C-5 aircraft. Many thanks to the Air Force for allowing us to uh, use that aircraft to transport. And here is SWAT unveiled in uh, the Astrotech facility on North Vandenberg. Uh, it's just a gorgeous spacecraft. And then after we processed on North Vandenberg, we put it back in its shipping container and brought it to South Vandenberg to Slick 4. And there it is going into SpaceX's uh, payload processing facility at Slick 4. Uh, there's a great uh, still photo of SWAT unveiled in the PPF at Slick 4. And there it is about to be encapsulated with the payload fairings on either side. Okay, so here is some, uh, some footage from the past. Uh, this is uh, a couple of years ago when we rolled out Sentinel. But this is what it looked like yesterday uh, as we rolled to the pad. Uh, it's a, uh, a long time coming. I think we've been developing and working on the concept for almost 20 years. Um, and, and NASA, as, as Karen describes, takes on challenging missions. We, we take on challenging missions to solve global problems. And water is one of those global problems. Uh, and, and water unites all of us. And uh, between the US and, and Europe, uh, we have been working on this concept for more than 20, 30, 40 years, as, as Karen said. So SWAT is the culmination of all of those, uh, those efforts from our scientists, engineers, uh, and, and management teams really working together to, to be able to form this mission and bring it to reality. So it's, it's, a, it's a long journey that, that we come up uh, against. And uh, now the, the last part of it, frankly, is actually the development preparation of the satellite, although that has had its uh, share of challenges, which we have worked together between the US and, and French team to solve every step of the way to get to this point today. So I want to show you, kind of illustrate a little bit of that. Uh, maybe if you can put up the first graphic uh, of, our, of our more recent journey, um, you, you can see that uh, we started the development um, of, the, of the, I would say, core part of the scientific portion of the spacecraft, which we call uh, the payload module uh, in, in the U.S. with, again, with contributions from uh, the, the 
CNES uh, and UK Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency and at JPL, where we integrated uh, the full payload. Uh, but that was the start of its journey. We, we developed it, tested it, and then um, we actually packaged it up shipped it to France, uh, and then continued its journey. You can see in this graphic on the, on the bottom left, Tim showed us arriving, but even well before that, uh, we, we made our journey uh, to, to Europe first, uh, and, uh, and then spent uh, about 14 months in, in Europe uh, in, in, uh, at the facilities of Talis Alenia Space. Uh, actually putting together our contributions and, and uh, CNES has thankfully contributed the what we call the spacecraft bus or, or spacecraft platform that was put together and then um, as we we went through a series a long series of, of tests um, and checkouts of the, of the satellite eventually brought that back uh, here to the United States for a beautiful launch on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. And uh, that itself uh, was, was challenging in, in putting together all of the teams, the logistics, uh, transportation, et cetera, to get to this point. And, and Tim showed a, a beautiful shot, I think, of us arriving here. And bottom left um, mm -hmm. is, uh, is a shot of us arriving on the uh, U.S. Air Force C-5 that, that NASA supplied to get um, this pretty large spacecraft and all of the support equipment over to Vandenberg Space Force Base here uh, that, that we now have started uh, over the last two months done our, our final campaign to check out the spacecraft uh, and get it ready for launch. So you can see on the next page, I think Tim already showed this, maybe on the next graphic, our, our, the, the satellite in its final configuration just before we said our goodbyes and in, in wishing it well in, in the, in the uh, encapsulated um, fairing of the, of the Falcon 9. Um, the spacecraft is, has been checked. It's in, it's in good health. And uh, we, we just finished um, some last checks um, during the night. And uh, we're really looking forward to um, continuing its journey uh, off into space and really uh, making the first part of, of the realization of SWAT, which is really getting up into launch uh, in orbit and starting to produce that important data which we expect is going to be transformational in, in many different fields and uh, really develop that next generation of measurements and information ultimately to, to help solve our global societal problems that I know Karen is, is dedicated towards uh, helping support. So on. So uh, let me give you uh, some information about, uh, about the payload. Uh, the first slide will show some of the instrument uh, on board uh, the satellite. So the payload basically is, is comprised of two parts. The one is the uh, what we call the nadir payload, which is a, a classical nadir suite of instruments that have been already flown on other ultimate mission, but uh, comprised using a, a radar altimeter. Uh, we see here, um, we see some pictures, the Doris system, which provides um, accurate information about the satellite position in space, which is uh, of prime importance, of course, uh, to determine the water height. Um, and, and the main instrument of the mission, which is, of course, the carrying instrument, the breakthrough instrument that will help providing these brand new uh, data that all uh, we are all expecting. Uh, Karin is a, a unique instrument, is a wide swath radar interferometer, and it's probably the flagship for a new generation of altimeters in space. So uh, this uh, payload was built by um, uh, JPL and uh, delivered uh, in France. Uh, in uh, in June 21, then we integrate. As I have uh, prepared some uh, patchwork of uh, of uh, views of the integration of the uh, of the of the satellite. So uh, the satellite integration begin in uh, August 21. It was a 14 months effort, a complicated effort because this payload is unique. Uh, we have a very big spacecraft with new procedures and so on, but we went through. And I would like to emphasize also that we had to face the COVID period. That was something we didn't expect, of course. And we had uh, to manage uh, that very specific uh, um, uh, period. Uh, again, as I said, 
thinks of the co close cooperation, the resilience efforts of everybody who were able to recover, to resume the activities in time and not jeopardize the schedule. So that was a unique way to show how uh, these teams are uh, working close together. Um, the, the satellite, which is uh, actually uh, was which, uh, which was built by uh, Thales Alenia Space, uh, Thales Alenia Space provided the platform, and uh, Thales Alenia Space performed all the uh, integration and test activities in their premises in Cannes for 14 months effort without major anomalies. So after that, we were able to ship. Uh, thanks to NASA providing a C5 because we had another problem to fix, which was the unavailability of the standard Antonov uh, planes that we use uh, 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 generally that were not available because of the Ukrainian crisis. So we had a solution that helped us meet meet the schedule. That was also another problem we we didn't thought we had to we had to face. After that, we came to the, of course, to, to, to the pad and do all, uh, our own activities. Everything went okay. We did all the checks and the spacecraft is, is ready to go today. And at this point, I'd like to emphasize also that, okay, we'll send the spacecraft in space. It will be a small journey uh, to, for, for it. And then uh, we have all the teams in Toulouse that will take over the responsibility of that baby, a newborn baby in space. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure the hundred of people that have worked, as you can see on the on the next slide, uh, people in the main control room are working day after day to make things, uh, of course, the smoother as it is uh, possible uh, for the next seven days. We have the first seven days that are very critical to get everything set in, in place and of course, we are starting for three and a half years of operations. 